I'm really happy to introduce Ezra Levin, who is a co-author of the Indivisible Guide, which maybe you can tell us, Ezra, how many times it's been downloaded now, hundreds of thousands of time, times, um, and really changed the face of our, um, of our politics right now. Um, so Ezra is a former congressional staff member, wrote the guide from that experience, and um, has been a great partner and friend to building this movement of resistance and victory. Um, so Ezra, thank you for being here and giving us a training on what to expect this week. Hey, Vicki. Th thanks so much for having me. Uh, and it really, it's, it's folks like Jezebel and Jeanette who are changing the face of politics in this country. We're, we're happy that people are finding the, the guide to be useful, but it's really about the people on this call who are making this happen. And so uh, I hope what we're putting out is useful. Um, so again, I'm Ezra Levin. I'm Executive Director of the Indivisible Project. And I'm going to start with a quick overview of Indivisible's principles and our theory of change, but I really want to dive into what I think is the really fun stuff, because it's recess, so we should be having fun, and there are opportunities this week, and some folks uh, probably on the line even have already taken advantage of them, to influence your members of Congress, uh, and that's the way we're going to resist the Trump agenda. So uh, at Indivisible, we, we really have three principles. Uh, one is that the Trump agenda is an abomination that needs to be resisted. And I think that's a pretty low bar for folks on the phone. I think we can all agree. The second, though, we have a particular perspective because we're, we're former congressional staff. So we believe that Donald Trump's agenda does not depend on Donald Trump. It depends on whether or not your individual members of Congress resist the Trump agenda or choose to rubber stamp it. So we believe in local defensive congressional advocacy, uh, focused on your two senators and representatives. But in the, third, the third value we have are progressive values. We think that groups ought to model uh, inclusion. They ought to practice respect and nonviolence and, and fairness at all times in their actions. This is both the right thing to do. We also think it's the strategically smart thing to do. Uh, where we take our inspiration is an unexpected place, possibly, for folks on the phone. It's from the Tea Party not because we agreed with their policies or their you know, incredibly nasty, sometimes violent behavior, but we think they got it right in terms of strategy and tactics. And that is a strategy that is focused on your home turf, on, at the local level, focusing on your members of Congress, and one that's pretty defensive, or at least focused on what is happening in Congress now, what are people talking about now. We believe that is the source of constituent power, that if you want to resist Trump's agenda, you focus locally, you focus defensively, and you never give an inch. So now I want to turn to talking about uh, some of the fun stuff that's happening this week. So what is recess? Congressional recess, if you look at the official congressional calendar, it's actually called the, the quote-unquote district work period. And it's called a district work period because members of Congress from the Senate and the House are expected to, to go back to their districts and their states and do work. And that work that they should be doing is listening to members of Congress. So you, all right, I'm sorry, the work that the members of Congress should be doing is listening to their constituents. Uh, that's why they get this time off to go back home. So you should expect your member of Congress to be listening to you this time. You should expect to get a chance to see them in person. Uh, and the best way to see them in person is at town hall events. So you should be able to, on your phone right now, if you know of a town hall event being held by any of your members of Congress, I'm going to ask you to press 1 if you know about it, or 2 if you haven't heard of any uh, event uh, like a public town hall being held by your member of Congress. So you press 1 if you've heard of a town hall, or 2 if you haven't. These town halls are in person. They're public. They're ways for constituents to hear from their members of Congress. Now, their goal, the members of Congress' goal, is actually just to craft their local image. They want to get positive local press. That's why they do this. But your goal here is really to make them listen. This is a unique opportunity to bring up important issues and encourage them to resist the Trump agenda once they get back in Congress. Uh, th that's why this recess week, starting two days ago and going on for the next several days, is such a huge opportunity for those who are resisting the Trump agenda. So what is the best way to make the most of a town hall? We, uh, if you go to indivisibleguide.com, you can get some resources, uh, a Reclaim Recess Toolkit, and this goes over some uh, general tips on what makes for a good town hall. Uh, one, you want to get prepared and make a plan. You want to get together with 
your fellow advocates that are, again, constituents of these members of Congress. Um, you want to ask good questions. You don't have to be a policy expert, though, to ask good questions. You just have to be a constituent, which if you're going to these events, you probably are. That means you're personally affected by the repeal of the ACA or the raids or the Muslim and refugee ban that Trump tried to put through. If you've got a personal connection to what this administration or Congress is trying to do, you have a great story to tell and a lot of legitimacy to ask that question. Now, when you're engaging in these town halls, it's really important to be polite, but don't be scared of being firm. You have a right to hear from your members of Congress. So if they're dodging or they're not answering your questions, feel free to push back and ask a follow-up question. Uh, again, they work for you. They should be answering to you. Now, it's not always going to be the case uh, that uh, the, the questions um, that you have on the top of your mind um, uh, you have ready to ask at the town hall. So what we've done, at, uh, again, in this indivisibleguide.com resource, is to put together a handful of topics that we think would be particularly useful during this, uh, during this congressional recess. So we think of this as three very defensive questions and one question that's more on the offense. So the three issues that we've brought up on defense is one, repeal of Obamacare. And you can get some district level statistics on exactly what will happen if Obamacare is repealed. We know that uh, there are millions of Americans who will lose their health insurance if this happens, but we also know what will happen within states and within districts. Your member of Congress, if they vote to repeal Obamacare, is voting to have a huge impact on their constituents, and they should know that. Uh, on the Supreme Court, President Trump has nominated an extremist far to the right to replace the, the current spot on the Supreme Court. Now, we don't think he has the mandate to do that, and we think that Democrats especially should be filibustering that. We also think that Republicans in the Senate should not vote to blow up the filibuster, to use the, the it's called the nuclear option to el eliminate that ability. You should be encouraging your members of Congress to oppose that. And the third defensive move here is on the Muslim and refugee ban. Now, we know that a court has struck this down, but we also know that Trump administration is looking at implementing a new version of this. Now, Congress has the ability to prohibit this, and they should. Your member of Congress should be committing to eliminating President Trump's ability to institute some similar racist ban of refugees and Muslims. And then the third piece is actually more on the offense than the defense. We know that Trump is the first president in modern American history to refuse to release his tax returns. We also know that he almost certainly has business conflicts of interest, and there are some really questionable activities going on with Russia. But we don't have all the information because he's not releasing his tax returns. Congress has the ability to unilaterally require Trump to release those tax returns, and we think you should be bringing that up during these town halls this week. So there is a good chance that your member of Congress isn't holding an in-person town hall. We've seen that many, many fewer members of Congress are doing that this recess. What we're seeing are a couple kind of games they like to play. One game is holding teletown halls. Now, these are on Facebook Live or they're on phones. But the bottom line, and sorry to be blunt, these are a joke. These are specifically intended by the members of Congress to give the appearance like they're listening to their constituents, when in reality, I can almost guarantee you that they're going to be screening the calls and making sure only positive questions come in. You should never accept a teletown hall as an alternative to an actual in-person town hall. And the second thing that these members of Congress like to do is an age-old tactic. It's called hiding. That's not rocket science. It's just, like, uh, it's just what it sounds like. It means that they don't want to face the tough questions that their constituents have, so they're really just hiding. But one more thing to tell you, I, I, as a former congressional staffer, I can almost guarantee you also that just about every member of Congress is going to be holding a fundraiser over this recess. So if they have time to hold a fundraiser, you, you really should expect that they have time to hold a public town hall. So you should ask them to do that. Now, 
let's say you've asked them to do that. They're still not scheduling a town hall. What do you do? Are you powerless? You're not. You actually still have a lot of power as a constituent. And this is actually a, a really exciting thing that we've seen people doing in South Carolina and Illinois and elsewhere in the country already during this recess. And what it is uh, is a constituent-led town hall. At uh, indivisibleguide.com, we put out a missing members toolkit that shows you how exactly to do this, but it's not that hard. All you do is you get a venue, and that can be the congressional district office or, or some outside venue, a church or a, uh, or a city center or a, a community center. Uh, you invite some speakers, include that member of Congress, have them uh, listed as a keynote speaker who's invited, and you should publicize that widely. Get in touch with local press. Let them know that you've got a lot of speakers coming to talk to the member of Congress when they show up. But be prepared for that member of Congress to be cowardly and not show up. Be prepared for them to hide. We've seen people have empty chairs. We've seen people with cardboard cutouts of the member of Congress. We've seen people play cricket noises uh, on, a, on an iPhone into a microphone uh, so that uh, it's clear that the member of Congress isn't answering their questions. Get creative. And what you're going to do is get press and coverage because of that. Because if you're recording it, you have a way to let everybody else know who wasn't there uh, that this is occurring, that the member of Congress is not listening to their constituents. And remember, like I said before, the thing the member of Congress wants most of all is to craft their local image. So if they don't show up this time and they get a lot of negative press for hiding from their constituents, they're going to reconsider showing up next time. So use that constituent power, hold that event, and pressure your member of Congress whether they show up or not. That's all I've got, Vicki. <laughs> Great. Um, and Ezra, um, I don't know if you see the results of the poll, but it looks like about 38% of people on the call tonight um, know about a town hall or public event that a member of Congress is holding this week, and 62% say they don't know of one. So that's not a surprise um, because as Ezra shared with us, um, many members of Congress have gone into hiding. Uh, but thank you, Ezra, for sharing with us um, some great and creative um, strategies and tactics for what to do in those cases um, and still make the most of the opportunity. Um, and actually, um, up next, um, we have two um, really amazing um, local activists who have led um, some successful actions where they live. Um, who are going to give us some tips on how to actually take what Ezra has just shared with us, put it into action in a couple of different places. Um, and then I'll remind folks that all of our speakers tonight will be on at the end of the call for Q&A um, towards the end of the evening. Um, so first, I'm happy to introduce um, Kristen Moline, um, who is a nurse and a member of the Oregon District 2 Indivisible Group. Um, and I'll let her just um, share her story. Kristen, go ahead. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. So yeah, I'm Kristen Moline, a full-time nurse and veteran and member of Oregon's District 2. Uh, I also happen to run our Twitter account. Uh, I live in Southwest Oregon, in the corner of the Southwest area of the state, almost at the California state line. So our problem is that the district is 70,000 square miles. Our, our Republican congressman is Greg Walden, and Greg Walden has two very populous areas representing 53% of his constituency. I'm in one of those populous areas. I'm in near Medford. And, and our problem is that he won't come anywhere near us. Uh, he hasn't held a town hall in my town in over two years, uh, which is an eternity in politics, particularly right now. So because I'm mad about this, um, last week, after learning about a few surprise town halls that were occurring in the opposite corner of the state, my husband and I decided to hop in the car for the 12 hour round trip uh, to the closest one of those town halls that was happening in rural Oregon. And ultimately there were 50 people at this town hall and what happened for me is, is in the car on the way there, I received a tweet message from Indivisible Team. And they were asking me if we would have a presence at any of these town halls. My response was, 
no, it's just me uh, due to the 830 mile round trip distance. So the answer that I got back to that was, whoa, that's bananas. And that got me thinking and my wheels started to turn and I said, this really is bananas. It's ridiculous. And I started to think about how can I leverage what I'm doing in this situation right now to garner, to get more attention. So I recorded a 30 second video that I tweeted at Representative Walden saying, if I'm driving all this way, I at least want a chance to speak. So please call on me. So that tweet uh, then ended up getting a lot of attention and being picked up by the Daily Coast and also a Bend news station. Once, once I returned home, I tweeted in my driveway a video that was a, like a minute long. And in that video, I captured the lessons that I learned. Um, what I learned from being at that town hall, I, I, I learned a lot, uh, but I'll, I'll share three. One is this worked as a creative way to draw attention to our particular situation, and it made it a story. Um, two is that when I was there at that town hall, I interrupted him. That occurred when he was dodging and avoiding questions. It did feel rude, but it also felt absolutely necessary and important. Um, I ended up standing up to him twice, uh, and I noticed at those times that he got definitely more vulnerable. I, I think what I would say about that is that all of us should feel empowered to interrupt and to be able to say, please answer the question. Number three would be that if, if I were Greg Walden, I would walk away from that town hall concerned, and here's the reason why. Um, that town hall, seemed civil, but it was tense, and he was supposed to be in a safe territory, which is why he was there in the first place. Uh, the most powerful moment was when I saw a woman stand up and say, I'm a registered Republican in this county, and I have been for about 40 years. I voted for you. We just want to be governed by who we elected, and we're scared about what we see. Uh, we by what we see. We, we, when can we expect you to start standing up to what's happening? So for me, like, why was that moment so powerful? What I saw, I saw hope and opportunities uh, from my perspective as we look forward to 2018. That moment illustrated two key points. One is when or how will GOP members distance themselves from this administration because that's where I felt like he was more vulnerable. And number two would be in, in when we think about inclusion, I think we really need to remember to include right, left, and center voices in locally as we move forward. Uh, the only other thing I'd mention is that uh, I could share the exchange that took place when I challenged him about the Muslim ban, the, the Muslim ban, if that's appropriate at any point. But that's all that I have. Uh, thank you so much, Kristen, um, for sharing your story tonight. Um, and uh, next, I'm happy to introduce um, Costa Kokinos um, from New York, who's going to share another story of um, what to do if your member of Congress is not uh, showing up in person, be it in your community or, in Kristen's case, six hours away. Um, thank you for making that trip, Kristen. And um, thank you, Costa, for sharing your story. Go ahead. Thank you. Yep, thank you, and thanks to all the speakers who came before me, and especially the writer of the Indivisible Guide. We use that sort of to base our actions. So I'm an organizer from the South Brooklyn Progressive Resistance. A little about us, we started as a small group of parents of young children in our neighborhood of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So on November 8th, we all cried, like so many of you out there, and then we chatted and formed a group to resist. So we're one of the many groups that have popped up in Bay Ridge and in South Brooklyn, and many of us intentionally work closely together to plan events and share ideas. And the action I'll share tonight originated with the announcement from our representative in Congress, Dan Donovan, that he would be hosting a teletown hall instead of a live one. <clears throat> and so um, some neighborhood groups reacted to that by bird dogging and protesting uh, Representative Donovan at a public speaking event hosted by the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. And that got lots of press. Um, Representative Johnson reacted by stating to the press that he did tele telephonic town hall last year. Um, he, they were very successful. 
um, and that they were huge and they reached thousands more people than an in-person town hall ever would and that he'd continue to do them now more than ever because of all the disrespectful protesting at the Chamber of Commerce event. And I'll tell you all right now, and I'll tell you at the end as well, don't be fooled by their narrative. So our representative is obviously scared, and so now he's forced to react. And so after that catalyst event, we brainstormed different actions for the day of the Teletown Hall. One would be to hold our own town hall, invite him, and listen to the Teletown Hall together and discuss and organize and maybe have a cardboard cutout representing him and to go live on Facebook and take some fun videos. So I can't recommend that enough. That's a great idea. And I see a lot of questions here um, in the interface from Janine and Reno, Court Courtney in New Jersey, Deborah in North Carolina, Shoshana from Anchorage and others about what to do to have a good event and how to convince your representative to have a town hall. So I think I'll echo what Ezra was saying. Pick a day this week, this week, maybe this coming Thursday evening. Secure a venue like a church or a library, even just a diner, the back room of a diner, something. Invite your representative and invite everybody you possibly can. So bring baked goods there um, and consider the planning tips that I'm about to share with you on the next slide, um, especially the media advisory and going live on Facebook. So we went with a different idea. We, our idea was to go out to his office, set up chairs outside, and bring the town hall to him. His town hall call was scheduled for 7 o'clock. We would bring our kids and make it seem like he's forcing families and their young children to sit outside his vacant Brooklyn office. So we went with that because we thought it would be a better visual and it was more accessible to the public because we could reach pedestrians as well and local res residents during the event. And so here are some key things that worked for us in planning the action. Aside from creating the event as a public event on Facebook, sharing it far and wide, we wrote and sent out media advisories to local and national press, as many as possible. We created a one pager, which you can see uh, to hand out to attendees so we could all be on the same page and to hand out to pedestrians passing by who wanted to know what we were doing. Um, so we decided beforehand who would take videos and pictures of the action and who would go live on Facebook, which again is crucial. We decided who would record the audio of the Tele Town Hall phone call. Also very important because your representative could perhaps never release that audio. Um, and finally, we decided to call the local police precinct community affairs office and ask what exactly is legal, what would get us arrested, and invite them to join us at the event. So the pro from calling the police was that no one was arrested and they provided barricades to cordon off a portion of the street and the sidewalk. Um, but the con was that they prohibited chairs and threatened to arrest anyone found sitting, which may or may not have damaged the key visual of the sidewalk event. Um, so uh, the main result of our action uh, was that we got the press to call out our representative and voice our demand for a real town hall. We also got to explain to the public in all the press why a town hall is less effective. A town hall is less effective than a regular town hall. Another big result is that we, right after we announced the event, I think the day of or the day after, our representative finally responded to our request to meet him in his office. So we invited, you know, five of us to meet with him. The more subtle result, the action was a total morale boost. So people on the teletown hall phone call at home had nothing to do but yell at their phones or hang up in a rage because not one of the hundreds of people in our group or in the parallel affinity groups in our neighborhood got to ask the question. So it was a little appalling. Um, those who participated in our action or who were watching it on Facebook or watching it online, I think they felt less voiceless. They expressed, definitely expressed afterwards appreciation that somebody was standing up to get the attention of our representative and our fellow constituents. So uh, through press releases, ours and theirs, um, our representative and we are attempting to create narratives. Their narrative you may recognize um, from all national news. His narrative is that the opposition is a bunch of angry paid activists creating fake news Trying to meet them in a public town hall would be a waste of time. So in response, we're creating our own counter narrative. How can our representative represent us accurately? And how can we ever hope to meet in the middle on any policies if he refuses to meet us in public and listen? Teletown halls are not fair or effective, and it's just not enough. 
They're too controlled. They're riddled with technical barriers. They allow for rigging in softball screen questions. Whether he's rigged the thing or not, it's still possible. And he's scared of his constituents, and it's apparent in his press releases. And we'll keep hosting events until he, he hosts an actual town hall. So a few quick lessons learned um, before I conclude. Your representative is very vulnerable to bird dogging, protests, and negative press. Every time you do something creative to get press that says he's scared or she's scared, they're avoidant and they won't listen, their staff is forced to react. And it only gives you power and helps you shape their narrative. If you don't do anything, your representative is free to shape their narrative any way they please. And then all of this shaping can then be used in a general election by the candidate that you want to vote for, the Democrat or whoever, once the general election starts. So along with that, understand that this is a long game of chess. Be prepared to react to your targeted representative with press releases and letters to the editor and in other creative ways to build that counter narrative. Consider community building activities that aren't overtly political, like a community breakfast or a dinner, a community action that tackles something less politically hot, but that everyone is really concerned about in your area, like traffic safety. Community events can happen parallel to the power tactics that you're using, and they can help build and broaden your base, as well as build that narrative about your own group. And the last lesson I just want to share is that Allow flexibility in your action plan. If it's going to be cold at your action, like it was in our case, or if the location no longer works for some reason, the press already left, it's beneficial to have a second location decided on beforehand so you can take the event somewhere else, perhaps warmer um, and somewhere more effective where you can better listen to the telephone call and take reaction videos. On our, in our event, it was 21 degrees with the wind chill, so it really would have been a good idea to have a second place to go. So thanks um, to everyone uh, for the opportunity to share our experience. We can do this. We're the resistance. We're strong, and we're getting battle hardier every day. So let's show our representatives, especially show all the people out there considering a run for your representative seat, that there is a resistance. We will not stop raising our voices, and we won't stop hitting the streets and being creative about it until we have a representative that will aggressively protect everyone's human and civil rights.